I'll follow it actually by saying I completely agree with everything Jane said. And this is another project that benefited hugely from the knowledge that the TDP team have within MOLA. Um, we're not used to digging on the foreshore particularly um, as professionals and, and the, the expertise that Nat and Elliot particularly have and came and educated us. Yes, certainly. Educated us, um, helped us with their knowledge, was really spectacular. But when Natalie asked me to come and, and speak here, I was slightly bemused because she said it would be great, Sadie, to have a dry site discussed. And I thought, well, OK. <laughs> that's, um, that's, an intre- oh, that's an interesting idea. Oh, wrong way up, sorry. Here we go. Because here, here's Jessica, who spoke earlier, up to her knees in mud. And here is me with the Thames lapping at my boots. So it wasn't exactly a dry site, necessarily, but I do take the point. We were behind the river wall, so we count as terrestrial, apparently. Now, the reason that I'm here, really, to talk about the medieval foreshore is because, of course, in the medieval period, um, the site was on the riverside, and we didn't have big walls like we have now. So you need to imagine that the archaeology I'm talking about was very much foreshore archaeology, lots of it. And I'm going to talk particularly about things that we found on the foreshore that relate to the use of the site behind, the buildings that we also excavated. In terms of where we are, I don't need to show you this map, actually, because if you walk out of this building, you can see the site. The the Tower of London is opposite us, and we are two doors up on the left as you look at it. The site's now called Landmark Place. Um, And it's obviously a development of um, nice flats for people that can afford such things with um, basement swimming pools and probably a Pizza Express or something on the ground floor, you know, the usual kind of thing. Um, And previous to that, it was called Sugar Key. And it was called Sugar Key for about 25... No, it was called Sugar Key for 40 years, actually, because it became the headquarters for Tate and Lyle. But previous to that, it was called the Old Custom House, for reasons that will become clear. Here we are um, on the site. This is last winter and spring, so we did um, January to June, not the ideal time to work on the foreshore, I I will admit. Um, And you can see that we're exactly opposite, so you can see London Bridge um, in the foreground. And the new custom house um, right in front of us here. Now, when you work in London as an archaeologist, obviously you benefit greatly from previous um, colleagues that have worked in the area before you, and this site is no exception. It was one of the first professional excavations ever undertaken in the city by the Department of Urban Archaeology in 1973, um, Custom House. Um, I've only got this terrible slide of a machine machining out some archaeology, which kind of says it all, I suppose. Um, It's famous because it was was supervised and and published by Tim Tatton Brown, who many of you will know as a famous archaeologist of medieval archaeology in particular, and now a cathedral archaeologist um, for many cathedrals across the country. Within his team, he also had a very young student. I gather he was very young at the time. It's 1973, don't forget. And that, of course, is Mr Gus Milne over there in the corner. Um, Natalie told me earlier this was Gus's first professional job. So I hope he got paid. (laughs) Um, So this is the excavation that happened before the building that we just knocked down happened, if you see what I mean. So this is the building, Sugar Key building, in in the foreground of this um, slide that you can see. The shard's still going up at this point, so this is 10 years ago, at least. Um, And and obviously it was was going to be redeveloped, so as commercial archaeologists we come in, as Jessica explained earlier, and and remove all the archaeology, rescue the archaeology really, before the site is developed. Now, there was lots of archaeology on the site, multi-phase archaeology, particularly fascinating Roman sequence, um, which I'll have to come back next year and tell you about, including the river wall and beautiful timber keys from the Roman period. What we're concentrating on today, of course, is the medieval phase of the site. So this slide shows the end of Roman London. Lots of the monuments are still um, there, but they're in, in decrepit state. They're falling down. You can see along the bottom of the slide on the north bank of the Thames, the river wall. And we are... Oops, about here. So the river wall um, survives through the, um, the late Roman period, obviously, and into the Saxon period as a ruin, but it's obviously a, a significant landmark um, along the north bank of the Thames. And behind the river wall runs what later became Lower Thames Street. So there's a road through Lake Saxon, um, the, the Lake Saxon London, really, that runs from um, Aldwych all the way along the river to um, what now is the site of the Tower of London. We didn't have much evidence of this site, of this period of activity on the site. A couple of pits dug into the river, into the Roman wall, maybe to to rob the masonry, the stonework. Um, and the site really gets going for the medieval period um, when this happens, 1066, obviously the Norman invasion, and immediately upon arriving in what later became London, um, they start constructing their Norman 
monumental buildings. This obviously is the White Tower of London. Now, there's no evidence of Norman activity on the site, but what we do have very, very quickly after that is the first major riverfront structure, and this is what we call a bulwark structure. We heard the word bulwark earlier during James's talk. Um, I'm led to believe it, it basically means a wall, a defensive timber wall, and this is a bulwark structure which we've had dendro dated, so tree ring dating to 1180 AD. So this is um, very early Saxon Norman archaeology. Um, constructed of very slow grown oak, probably wild wood, so we're not in we're not talking about industrially grown oak at this stage, we're talking about trees that are naturally grown being chopped down and used. And you can see that it's very simply constructed of, of upright posts with slots cut in them within which the, the, the planks just then are placed. And this was um, at the time that the street that I mentioned earlier was being used, this was the main river frontage for this part of the city. Um, the next sort of major thing that happens on the site is, well, this happens next door, obviously. This is the Tower of London moat being extended and constructed in 1241. I've pinched this picture on the HRP website, but it's a really fantastic um, illustration of the moat construction, the monumental um, excavation that was involved in that. And obviously you can imagine that the silting that was created in the River Thames from the, from the digging of all this earth um, from around the moat created um, lots of silting and raised the level of the river quite significantly. So the next bit of development we have in terms of timber structures and Thames revetment um, is this on the left. So the bulwark we just looked at is here. This is um, 1180 in date. And on the left oh, is this, which is um, late 13th century, so just after the 1241 slide we saw. And the interesting thing is, and Damien is in the audience, and you can, you can pick his brain's in the bar afterwards about this, because he really contributes to a lot of, of the facts I'm telling you here. But um, the really interesting thing is that there's, there's um, high tide mark wearing on the posts, so you can see where the high tide has come up and eroded the tops of the posts. And that happens about here in the 12th century, and then it happens up here 100 years later. So within 100 years, the Thames high tide has lift has raised by almost a metre. And that's significant. That would have been a big... Um, a difference to the landscape and topography of this part of the city. In fact, all the city, of course. And the next slide just shows um, looking towards the tower. So we're looking parallel to the Thames. Now, of the same structures, you can see the really um, fantastic front brace, all oak again, with anchor piles at the bottom to stop the revetments and the river walls floating into the into the river. But the interesting thing about this slide is that within 100 years, the waterfront line has remained the same. So no one's encroached into the Thames at this point. We know that other parts of the city had jetties heading into the Thames um, at this stage, and the waterfront moves back and forth. On this side, the, the, the waterfront has remained in the same position. And that's because, and again, we look back to Tony Dyson's amazing documentary research he did um, many years ago, and we, we're, we're going to hive, um, we're going to re-excavate his archives again. But we know that behind here, um, there's a really good continuity of, of occupation of the buildings behind the riverfront. So that the, the line is maintained. In fact, I think it's a pub and a brewery, which is rather nice. But the site, at this point, it's, it's foreshore and it's revetments and it's probably um, shipping activity, maritime activity. No buildings to speak of. Um, the buildings really kick in in the 13th century um, with the construction of, on the left-hand side, so the western side, this is Wool Wharf. Um, obviously, the, name, the clue is in the name. It's, it's mainly associated or involved with the importation and exportation of wool. Um, and this side is Stone Wharf, and I'll leave you to imagine what that was involved with. Um, and at this point, um, the, the importation of wool and exportation of wool becomes subject to a customs charge. And wool is the first commodity in Britain, that, that in England, that is subject to this thing. Um, and because it's, it becomes a tradition and a custom, we get the word custom. Um, so the custom of collecting tithes from the importation and exportation of wool originated on, on this site just over the river here. And we have lots of, of evidence um, from this particular phase. This is probably the, the most extensive phase of medieval archaeology we have on the site. There are lots, but this is one I'm going to mainly talk about today. This is, of course, the A-gas map. This is slightly later than, than the building, but um, it's on there. So this is a rather nasty plan. Sorry about this. Um, I should have said at the beginning that we're all still working through the records. I always say this when I come... It's, it's early days with the analysis of all the finds and things, so all we've got is the initial assessment of what, of what, we, what we think we had on the site, and we've yet to do the detailed work drilling into the, the chronology and, and the actual details of the finds. So this is um, 
not a great plan, but the Woolworth building is represented by the, by the hashed sort of bit up here. So this is the western side of the site. The Thames is down here. Um, and these are bits of Woolworth building. And we have um, various um, timber revetments and jetties that are associated with that building um, coming out into the Thames and um, running parallel here. This is the bulwark we saw, the 1180 AD um, structure. And here is the later front brace structure that we, we saw a slide of earlier. I'm going to bring this slide back up, so don't think you have to remember this. But this is what we're looking at now. These walls are associated with, with Woolworth. And they are quite, quite fabulous, really. Those um, amazing preservation, considering that it had been dug already in the 70s, and then a lot of um, work had been done. They had basements, lots of concrete, things like that, truncating or disturbing all this earlier archaeology. But we still had really nice survival. And these are the foundations of, um, of the Woolworth building. Um, and next to them, or at the bottom of the slide, you can see, I don't know if you can see, it's not great, uh, here, timbers um, that form part of a, um, <coughs> of a river wall. And these timbers are made of reused planking from clinker-built vessels um, that were obviously broken up in the area and, and reused in, in the jetties and revetments of Wall Wharf. There's another slide coming up. This is um, the other side of the wall we just saw. <coughs> So this is another really lovely oak structure with um, these anchor piles again, the circular piles that are driven really deep in and, and prevent everything from slipping into the river really. Um, front bracing, really amazing preservation. This is 1973 concrete, so we're really lucky that we have that much of the clinker built um, planking surviving. And on the other side, I think that's Jessica again there, a bit drier this time, but this is um, the extension of this timber here in, a, in another bit of the trench and you can see that it's, it, it survives to above um, the archaeologist's head so we have really nice amazing survival of the, of the, of the planking and this um, was actually dendrode to 1274 so we have documentary of 1275 being this time when um, the custom house or, or the wool wharf became subject to um, the, the customs for wool and also 1274 a nice um, combination of science and archaeology um, <coughs> for the dating. Now, the interesting thing about the clinker shattering is that it's, it's nailed together using a particular specific type of nail called a rove nail. They're made of iron and they have a flat head. And at this time, they're not really very well used or known about in, in England, in London particularly. They are found on occasion, but generally they're associated more with the low countries, um, Holland, Belgium, that part of the world. Um, and so Damien's um, pr proposition really for these is that either the clinker built boat had originated from the Low Countries and was broken up in London, or that we have carpenters, shipwrights, um, who had originated in that part of the world and were using the tradition in London. The first interpretation is probably the more um, accurate. So this, I should have said, this, is, this would be the Thames at this point. So um, we have jetties coming in and out of the Thames. Um, back to here again. So this... We just looked at that. We're going to look at this bit now. This is the, um, the revetments associated with the Wool Wharf building. And this is one of the things that was excavated extensively in the 1970s um, during the period that Gus was on the site and Tim Tatton Brown were digging. And although they worked um, in much smaller time scales with much more pressure and much less health and safety, as some of the other photos I didn't show illustrate, um, they managed to create these amazing records of their excavations, including these. This is, um, again, not a great photo, I'm afraid, but this is from the Lamas 1974 volume, a really fantastic publication of that site, and beautiful hand drawings. And you can see, um, we need to note for further um, later, the anchor piles again. And we found these um, because they didn't, they didn't take away all the timbers in the 1970s. They actually covered lots of them up and they're still there for us to reinvestigate, which is really fantastic. And we, we've taken further dendrochronological samples of, um, of these timbers because this was actually one of the first sites, again, that they did um, tree ring. They used this, this method of, of dating on. So we can now go back and reevaluate the, their results and collab, um, calibrate all the, the dating from this. But this is the same um, structure, really. And here you can see, I don't know if you can see, but there are... Um, Roman numerals marked on the base plate, and, and this um, is like the old IKEA thing, isn't it? Um, denotes prefabrication, basically, so quite a significant effort's gone in. It's not just hammered together on the foreshore by a group of guys using timbers that they picked up on their way. This is um, significant 
carpentry and, as I say, prefabrication. This structure, um, because obviously this, this is, would have been the upright planking, but the planking was taken away in the 70s to fit the, the building in, but the base plates and the anchor piles and all the land ties and things were still there. And it was extended eastwards. Um, this is a bit that wasn't <coughs> dug in the 70s, so we have more upstanding um, oak planking surviving. And it was extended eastwards um, in the early 14th century, so soon after the 1270 date that I gave you earlier. Um, as, as the custom, uh, as Woolworth took over more of the foreshore and managed more of the, the immediate area. And the construction of this, um, because it's, it's so organised and, and the wood is so um, well treated, well carpentered, if that's a, a noun, I guess it might a verb, I guess it must be, um, denotes that the people, again, are building this to um, a civic standard, really. They have um, centralised money, administrative money. It's not some person's personal backyard or a business um, and that is all associated with the use of the site of course as one of the main the main um, place for import and export of wool and collection of customs now the uprights are really big and strong and would have looked impressive <clears throat> but Damien says that the base plates were in fact much more flimsy because they were always hidden so they're saving money even in the 14th century this is another part of um, the same structure that was excavated in the 70s. Again, you can just see that the, the front bracing here was um, in situ when they saw it, and they had to take all this down because it was in the way of the building. But luckily, the base plate from that very structure survived, so we have been able to match up our plans with their plans and work out um, exactly what went where. So it's archaeology of Gus as well as archaeology of medieval period. Now, we had... We don't have much evidence for the later phase of the Custom House, but the Custom House becomes the Custom House, really, in the 14th century, when, about 1460, when it's, it's sold to John Churchman and his wife, Sarah, and they, they take over control of, of the customs for wool, and he becomes a controller of customs on the site. And they would have managed a team of, of people, men, obviously, who would, have, who would have been based in the building on the site, and who would have rowed out to the ships in the Thames, collected the customs, and rowed back. So the money would have been kept in this building on the site. They didn't keep wool there, but they kept the, the money and all the administ administrative services that would have been involved in this import-export business. Um, and as well as the churchmans, um, between 1374 and 1386, um, Geoffrey Chaucer was the, law, the main controller of customs for England, appointed by the king, no less, and he worked in our building collecting customs. <clears throat> and at this time, in the 14th century, wool duty was responsible for a third of the total um, money within the realm of England. So this was a hugely significant position for him to have had and a hugely significant economic donation, really, um, to the workings of, of England at the time. Um, he didn't make any money himself, though. Apparently, he's far too honest. He, his main customs men, who he would send out in boats, normally worked for... Um, people that were in the city, merchants in the city, quite often the Lord Mayor came from wool families. We had several um, Somerset wool men, wool farmers who became Lord Mayors later on. So the wool trade is inextricably linked really with the City of London and the early development of the Corporation of London and all the guilds. Um, and, and Geoffrey Chaucer was kind of responsible, but I, I read lots of things that suggest that he may have turned a bit of a blind eye because he was probably too busy writing Canterbury Tales, which is this kind of date. Um, and he let them make money from their own wool in a very uh, dishonest... And who, who would imagine that happening today? But the thing about the foreshore, <clears throat> and James mentioned this earlier, it's really interesting how specific the finds from the different parts of the foreshore can be. And we're only up the road from you, 100 metres maybe, perhaps. Um, and we have very specific finds on, on our site as well, um, particularly because the custom house would have been guarded. So significantly, you wouldn't have been able to come and moor in front of it. Um, there's lots of money there, there's people controlling the, the king's money. Like I say, a third of the, of the wealth of the realm has come through that one building. And there would have been um, very strict control over what happened in front of that building itself. Um, people did drop stuff, though, of course. Um, and there's a few examples of things. Um, it wouldn't be a TDB conference without a rude badge. That's a phallus on that one. This apparently is a, a bawdy badge, a lover's token, apparently. Um, from the medieval period, and, and a lady would have worn it on her her cloak, apparently, which is charming. <laughs> <coughs> There's also um, Thomas Beckett again, top left. Crops up everywhere. And it's really nice that Chaucer worked on this site because the Canterbury connection is irresistible, really, and you can make it directly through the finds that we've got. 
And then this rather battered bit of metal here is actually made of lead, and it's an ampulla, which is a container for holy water, which would have hung perhaps from your hip and um, your belt, and it would have been tied with leather. And um, they're obviously really closely connected to, quite often, the, the pilgrim way to Canterbury. And this one has four heads on it. You can't really, you can only really see one. Um, but we think that these are the four knights who were sent to murder Thomas of Becket in Canterbury Cathedral in 1170. So um, we also have a couple of other Thomases, but I, I didn't show, haven't brought those. So we have, we have um, the, the pilgrims um, related finds, a few of, not many of, but we have a lot more of, of, of finds related to trade and industry, which is exactly what, what you would expect on a site like the Custom House. <clears throat> um, so lots of coins. Um, this is a, and jetons. This is actually a jeton from France, 15th century. And on the back it has um, the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God. Um, this is a tumbrel made of copper alloy, which is a very um, delicate tool for weighing very light weights. So um, the middle thing here um, drops down and you would have suspended whatever, whatever it was you were weighing on that weight and you, on that, and you could have weighed um, very small amounts of things. Um, top left is a uh, Kingston Ware jug, which is related to drinking games. So again, nothing really new happens on the Thames, but hasn't already happened there. There are also lots and lots of um, finds related to textile industry, which is nice because that confirms completely the wool connection. And other finds that relate to, um, as I say, trade, weighing things and the commercial activity. That relates to the foreshore in front of the custom house. And they, lots of the finds, as I say, relate very much to the function of that building. But to the east of our site, so up towards um, Tower of London, very slightly, we had a very different assemblage. And here, much more industrial, um, much more iron, their tools, their axes. Um, on the left is just one bag worth of, of, of artifacts from one deposit we were, we were digging, gravel on the foreshore. You can see there's a really fantastic um, lock, lots of keys. Um, but these, these tools, and I'm not an expert in ship breaking, but luckily there are plenty in the audience today, so we can ask them about that afterwards as well. Uh, these relate probably to ship breaking, which was going on on the eastern side of the site, where, where Stone Key had been, and which um, wasn't part of the custom house um, ownership. So we're going to do lots of really interesting, well, boring perhaps, statistical analysis of where the finds are on the site and, and how they relate to the buildings behind them. Because the foreshore, um, although we know things wash in and out all the time, actually a lot of them stay where they were deposited and that's why it's really interesting to study the our bit of the foreshore in relation to the buildings. Now of course there's always a wall um, and the wall for the custom house, so 15th century we're into now, um, runs through the site halfway, exactly halfway across, so it's about 30 metres north of where the current uh, river wall is. And this is the bottom of it, so it's, um, the bottom of it is chalk and ragstone um, consolidation, and above would have been probably nice uh, ragstone above, and it's on lots and lots of smaller elm, elm piles. And Jess showed a slide of a pile earlier that had an iron shoe on it, uh, um, and that's what all of these piles had as well to ease the driving in through the horrible gravelly foreshore deposits. Um, and there were some finds, again, that washed up against this wall. And we all know that river walls can be quite interesting because things get caught or stones create um, buffer zones where finds accumulate. And this is no different. And next to um, this wall, washed up, we found this sort of manky lump of metal. Although somebody spotted it wasn't that manky. Um, and we took it back to conservation lab and, and it turned out to be, um, this, is ex, this is an x-ray of it, but it turned out to be a, a buckler shield and it's a shield that was used um, in the um, 14th or 15th centuries for hand-to-hand -hand combat but mainly defensive so they weren't often used actually in combat, they were used for example by people guarding things and I know you can guess where I'm going with this but we hope that this um, is a custom house guarding related artifact. So it's constructed using hundreds of, of tiny copper alloy rivets, and it probably had a leather or a wooden front to make it quite light to carry um, sort of at face height, really. Incidentally, they did find one in 1973, but we don't know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> There's more of that, don't worry. Um, we also had some really interesting things that relate to um, other activity going on. So we had lots of cannonballs, um, double figures of cannonballs actually, they're all quite small, so you can see the hands are for scale in these photos, these are site photos, but ones of stone and ones of iron. Iron on the left, stone on the right. 
Um, and, and we had a visit from the, the, the Royal Armouries at the Tower of London while we were on the site, and they were really fantastic. They came and they, they were really interested in what we were doing, and um, they saw all these, and they said, well, that's really interesting, because in the 16th century, we used to use um, the art, the Tower of London used um, the Custom House key to offload and, and load up armouries for the armouries at the Tower of London. So some of these things could actually have been um, headed for the tower and dropped off the boats or, or fell off the quay during, during loading. But it also, um, colleagues have done research on sites on the south of the river here, in fact, this, this very place, um, and found, or where we found huge stone cannonballs in the past. And it turns out that in the War of the Roses, South London was throwing cannonballs over at, at the Tower of London and vice versa. So it may be that these actually were thrown in, in, um, in anger at North London, which is all fine by me. <laughs> I can say that, we're south now. We also had other um, military finds. This is a really lovely um, iron Quion dagger, it's called. Um, Quion because of the, the, the curve, the um, circular um, wrist guard at the, at the top, hand guard at the top, with a biro for scale. Another, another site photo, sorry, it's not very professional, but you, can, you know how big it is. Um, <laughs> they are Scottish in... Um, in design, in, there's lots of, not lots, but a few examples from Aberdeenshire, for example. Um, this is really interesting because we heard later on about Scots coming to the docks, didn't we? Well, maybe they were, this, these are early, um, early arrivals in the, in the 15th century. Um, and it would have hung from your waistband, and again, it, it's used in um, hand-to-hand combat. And the, the Armouries team actually saw this when they came, they visited them. They've got one in the Tower of London display, but ours is actually nicer than theirs. So they were quite keen to, to take it on. But we are working with them quite closely on lots of the military we found because this isn't something that we have particular expertise in, and they obviously do. So it's a good, good excuse, um, good opportunity for us to, to collaborate with um, a, really, a team of really amazing experts. This came from the back of the 1973 trench and was, and was closely associated with a 1973 50 pence piece. <laughs> so in terms, of, in terms of dating, we are going on chronologies that are published not stratigraphic uh, contextual information. But I'm sure that your finds retrieval methods have improved since then, Gus. <laughs> <laughs> so the custom house um, that was the one we were just discussing falls in, is no longer big enough for all the money it's making and, and all the people that need to work there. So in the um, early 17th century, it um, is late late 16th century, sorry, it's replaced by a pool at Custom House, and there's no evidence of this at all, sadly, because it's a really amazing octagonal building built of fantastic Tudor bricks. There's a, there's a very similar building in St Giles, which we, we found a few years ago, which colleagues are working on now, which is the same um, style of structure, which is really fascinating and contemporary as well. So there's two octagonal buildings in the city at the same time, which is fantastic. But, but Paul, it was the, was the name of the man who financed it and built it. Um, and this survived throughout the Civil War, which was some feat, really, considering what was going on at the time. Um, but it burns down, funnily enough. Uh, this isn't the only custom house that burns down, actually, which more later. And it's replaced by Sir Christopher Wren's really fantastic Palladian masterpiece, as all the, the quotes say, Wren's custom house, which doesn't last very long either. And there's no evidence, we didn't find much evidence of this on the site either, actually, although we did find a tiny bit of wall, which was really special, um, built of huge ashlar blocks. Wren's Custom House burns down and is replaced by the Ripley Custom House. Again, a really spectacular structure on the Thames, and what a shame that none of these survive. Um, but funnily enough, Ripley's Custom House burns down as well in 1840. <laughs> when um, a stash of gunpowder in the basement, which is a really good idea, ignites and blew um, records of tax all across the city of London, apparently. <laughs> There's really good documentary evidence for people running around collecting dockets and, and reading everyone's tax details, which is, which is funny. Um, but they didn't bother, re they, they didn't build, rebuild the custom house on our site. They then moved next door, of course, and built what we call the new custom house, rather quaintly. Um, and here is the new custom house, and we know it's there now, and it's grade one listed building, and it's a really fabulous um, structure on the Thames. And our site is now here. Um, and I only really show these as an excuse to show some really nice Thames photographs. But um, we're still in the middle of the city, in the middle of the docks, with all the, all the activity going on, and right in the commercial heart of, uh, by this point, of course, the British Empire. 
Uh, and this again is, is a later one, this is 1930, so just pre-war because the site did suffer, um, obviously as you can imagine, some bombing in the Second World War, but this is pre-Second World War, so you can see um, the new custom house here, and our site is really packed with um, warehouses and cranes, and all the boats are in the river queuing up really to offload at the various jetties that were um, right in the city. And then just to bring us up to almost where we are now, this um, is a, is a post-war, um, not very nice <laughs> ordnance survey plan of what was actually going on, but really nicely the name survives from 1270 to 1952. Wall Key um, has, has perpetuated or persisted. And there's lots of loading platforms. This huge structure here turned out to be a, a crane base, and we found it actually during the excavation, but the concrete and brickwork was about six metres deep, so we left that there for the, uh, for the, for the workmen to deal with. Um, and lots of jetties again and um, busy part of the port. And I think this, yeah, this is my last slide, so thank you very much. <laughs>